Well, hiya. Welcome back to VG Emporium. Hope you're excited for this week's special event, the Famicom Expansion Chip Extravaganza. I'm gonna be sharing with you a track from each chip showing off their sound expansion capabilities. So settle yourselves in. This is gonna be a hefty one. Well, to start, let's tell you about what the expansion chips are. When the Famicom came out, it was a pretty, you know, pretty solid piece of hardware. It kind of set the standard for home consoles then on out from 1983. Um, but, you know, and then, um, you know, at some point, Nintendo started making a, made a, a chip to help kind of expand its memory mapping abilities and, you know, some of the audio capabilities. And then other companies started making their own chipsets to do the same thing, you know, like each one being more powerful or being able to do, you know, diff you know, things that the others couldn't. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. It's going to go down the list here. We got, you know, about, I think, five different chips plus a whole system that, like, you know, that Nintendo made to attach to the Famicom, which I imagine you know what that is, but we'll talk about when we get there. Let me introduce you to this uh, track that we started off with. It's the title theme from Famicom Tentai Club, Keita Kokeisha, or the Famicom Detective Club, The Missing Air, composed by Kenji Yamamoto. And as you could probably tell, this is your standard Famicom NES sound. You know, so it's just two squares in the triangle, and the noise kind of giving that little bit of percussion in there. This is provided by the RP2A03's um, audio processing unit, or the APU, which is built inside this you know, chip. And it provides the two square waves, the triangle wave, a noise generator, and sample playback provided by the DPCM through the DMC, which is... Uh, differential pulse code modulation through the delta modulation channel. I should mention that the 2A03 was only in the NTSC region, so Japan and the US. And then the, what PAL got, or the you know mostly European and South America got, where it was the uh, RP2A03. And not too much of a difference except for the hertz speed. So, you know, NTSC got 60 hertz, PAL got 50 hertz. So if you play games that are like, you know, set to the PAL, you'll notice that they're a little slower. And there's a lot more technical gobbledygook that is involved with this that it kind of goes way over my head, so I'm not going to get into it. But essentially, this is going to be the base of everything else that's going to be coming up next. So, you know, that... Trucks. So, yeah. Just like, you know, the two squares, the triangle, the noise, and then, you know, the, the sample channel, if they so choose to use it. And the one of the most obviously unfortunate things that, that is involved with this is that, um... None of the, everybody else outside of Japan did not get the expansion sound because of uh, the design of the NES cartridges. They took the, the uh, pins, I guess, from there and relocated them to the bottom of the console for future um, expansion peripherals or something, but that never happened, which is unfortunate. And the uh, you know, only way we started to find out about this was back in the early days of, you know, like video game music ripping that people started finding, like, you know, the Japanese versions of some games, so the best case is, uh, you know, Castlevania 3 having a much more fuller, like, cooler sound compared to what we got. So, yeah. Fun facts. And so now this game, Famicom Tentai Club, is a set of games which is the first writing project of Yoshio Sakamoto, who would go on to create the Metroid series. And it is a adventure and, like, detective game, uh, Definitely very much inspired by Enix's game, the uh, Portopia Serial Murder Case, with horror elements that were inspired by the uh, Italian director uh, Dario Argento, and some uh, detective novels written by Japanese author Seishi Yokomizo. And the gameplay, nah, gameplay is based around like windows, so like you know one will show like the scene or the character you're talking to, then one will show like the you know the text that they're you know what they're saying, and then the other one shows like all the commands and options that you have. So you know, kind of like an early early adventure game. And now the composer, uh, Kenji Yamamoto, he is a longtime Nintendo composer. Um, got started doing uh, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. They would do a uh, Super Metroid. Um, he has also done soundtracks for multiple, like, set Metroid games. So, like, you know, the Prime Trilogy, a lot of the, uh, like, Game Boy Advance games. Um, he also did a few of the Brain Ages and is now, like, an audio director. And his most latest project that he's done is a, uh, Fam like the Famicom Detective Club remake in 2021 and Metroid Dread. Now let's get on to our first sound expansion here. So this next uh, track I got for you is Level 3 from Falcion, composed by Atsushi Fujio, Shinya Sakamoto, and Shigehiro Takanochi.
Level 3 from Falcian, composed by Atsushi Ujio, Shinya Sakamoto, and Shigehiro Takenuchi. And you could probably already immediately tell, you know, there's a big difference in the sound here, not only from that familiar Konami percussion, but also that really cool lead from the additional sound channel provided by the Famicom Disk System. So let's get into it. The Famicom Disk System, or for now to be referred to as the FDS, was a uh, new system that Nintendo had made to that would connect to the Famicom and would uh, gave it a basically a disk drive. And Nintendo made special disks that would go into it that had Nintendo on it, and only those would work in it. You couldn't copy. Oh, well, people found a way to copy them anyway. But they had a um, <clears throat> you know for games like you know Zelda and I think Metroid. I don't know. Like just few games like gave it like the save feature and all this cool stuff. But also this uh, a new sound channel which was a wave channel provided by the uh, RP2C33 chip that was on the Disk System's RAM card. So what it was is like, you know, wavetable synthesis. And uh, it had some, it was, was uh, kind of different from the uh, Game Boy's wave channel that would come out later. It had a little bit more of a, maybe a rounder tone is the way best I can explain it, I don't know. You know, as you can, you'll probably hear it coming up here. Now take a listen. As you can hear, not as crunchy or gritty as the uh, Game Boy's wave channel, but yeah, it's kind of a little bit more softer, a little more gentler. I don't know. And actually, a fun fact for The Legend of Zelda that was released on the FDS, um, all the sound effects were made using this sound channel. So, but, and when we got it in the, here in the States, they kept those sound effects in there, but they they uh, recorded the, uh, the sound output and then played it through the DPCM channel on the... Uh, you know, on the uh, 2A03. And they did the same thing for The Legend of Zelda Link's Adventure. So, you know, that that part where you get the game over screen and Ganon's looking at you and that laugh, that wah, 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 wah. There it is. That's that wave channel from that good old FDS being lived vicariously through that sample channel. So now Falcian. What is? It is a quote unquote 3D shooter made by Konami. Uh, made to be used with the uh, 3D glasses peripheral that came that was for the FDS. It was very uh, similar to the uh, Sega Master System's 3D glasses, except it used a different kind of shutter technology, shuttering thing in there, so it made it a little more cooler looking. I don't know, but it wasn't, you know, from my reading, it was still pretty janky. It's the gameplay and everything. And to give you an idea how it looked, um, think Space Harrier, but 8 bit. And now these composers, Konami Kukeha Club members all. We have Atsushi Fujio has done Gyrus, Life Force, Twin B3, Shigehiro Takanochi, Metal Gear on the MSX, Gra Gradius 2, and then Shinya Sakamoto, Green Beret, Esper Dream, Castlevania The Adventure, and Quarth. Short list, yes, but we have much ground to cover, so let's continue. We have our first actual expansion chip that went inside a Famicom cartridge. And the track made with it I'm going to play for you is Winga Celebration from Just Breed, composed by Kohei Tanaka.
That was Winga Celebration from Just Breed, composed by uh, Kohei Tanaka. So now what's the MMC5 adding here? Well, it is uh, adding two extra square channels and then the um, the samples are now being processed as a PCM in place of the DPCM of the 2083. Um, you know, not much of a difference, you know, it might sound a little cleaner, but you know, you can only really tell if you're listening closely. And again here, there's a lot more um, technical jargon that just goes over my head, so you know, I'm not going to bother with that. So now I'm going to show you what those two extra square channels are doing. I'm not going to be soloing out the, uh, the sample because, you know, it's, like I said, not too much of a difference really, so I'm not going to bother with that. So, here we go. As you can tell, these extra channels are providing the main melody, whereas the square channels provided by the 2A03 are doing the kind of like the backing, kind of trilly melody thing, whatever. Um, yeah, and uh, they're basically identical to each other as far as sound, because like it's just like they just took those, plopped them in this uh, MMC5 chip, and about this MMC5 chip, it's more than just providing extra sound. Um, it is the most powerful. A mapping chip created by Nintendo for you know the NES and the Famicom games, uh, so meaning that it allowed for more processing power, like you know much more like you know things going on screen. So like you'd have like you know like more cooler looking sprites or more colors going on, a lot more movements, a lot more like uh, kind of like cool transitions and stuff. A good example would be it was used in Castlevania 3 because you know it had all these like you know multiple characters, multiple things going on. Like it was like a pretty big game. For, you know being on the NES and a lot of you know pretty big compared to you know like Castlevania or Castlevania 2 before it and it was because of this mapper chip but it did not use the extra sound channels um, that was provided by a separate chip which we're going to be getting into in a bit but now I'm gonna tell you about the composer of this fine track this is Kohei Tanaka and uh, start off his first thing he did was a cybernetic high school part 3 gunbuster on the MSX and so jumping ahead, he did the music for both Alundra and Alundra 2 on the PS1. Did music for a lot of Sakura Wars or Sakura, Sakura Tyson in Japan. Um, you know, starting with the Saturn, then you know, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Dreamcast, PS2, PSP. Did music for the Bionic Commando um, remake. I think this is like what the 2009 one. Um, let's see. Also did Gravity Rush and Gravity Rush 2. Which is this last credit that I could find. And now Just Breed. What is Just Breed? It is a tactical 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 role-playing game. Um, released in 1992. And it's uh, pretty well known for being like for its long like production time and being the largest RPG on the Famicom. And the story goes is that um, in the town of Astom, it is protected by a sapphire wielding priestess Spheris. She is uh, kidnapped, and so the, our nameless hero, who is also her lover, must go rescue her. And in this rescue mission, you take control of six main characters who each have control of six different soldiers, and they're of different classes and all. And um, I think the gameplay is kind of compared to Fire Emblem and Shining Force as far as how the strategy works out. And looking at some screenshots of this game, uh, you know, it's a really nice looking game. You know, like the character sprites are pretty easy to distinguish from the backgrounds, the backgrounds themselves, and the maps are pretty nice detailed and um, looking at a screenshot of the final boss I'm guessing and it's pretty crazy looking you know like uh, all jaggy and some cool creepy detail there and that's all thanks to this mapper chip MMC5 so now we're gonna move on to our next expansion chip the heavy hitter the one that most everybody knows about that's in really into VGM the VRC6 by Konami and the track I'm gonna be using as example is book 2 train from Esper Dream 2 composed by Kunoyo Yamashita.
That was Book 2, Train, from Esper Dream 2, composed by Kinoyo Yamashita. As you can probably tell, there's a lot more sounds going on. There's a kind of like a buzziness going on. There's some nice like kind of square, like the, some of the squares sound a little different. And let's, uh, well, the reason for that is that the uh, VRC6 provides, once more, two extra square channels and a sawtooth. So with the square channels, um, they have eight um, with like pulse width, like with the pulse of that, that. God, my tongue is so dry. Why? But okay. So whereas the regular square channels on the two A zero three have four widths of pulse, pulse widths of pulse, the VRC six square chip square channels have eight widths of pulse, so it can have like much more like a dynamic sound. And the breakdown here is that the two A zero threes. Uh, squares kind of being used as like uh, kind of like backing up the VRC6's one like first square channel for like the melodies and then the second uh, VRC6 square is being used for kind of like that counter melody the second square of the 2A03 isn't being used at all and then the sawtooth is being used to kind of give that buzzy back up to the triangle for the bass but um yeah it's a pretty cool sounding thing and um you'll hear it like it was used in the Castlevania 3 or Akumajo Densets as it is called in Japan, but you know, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. I'm, I'm just gonna bring this up, solo it out for you so you can hear what's going on. Check it out. Yep, adding a little something extra. So now a little tale. So, Castlevania 3, it comes out here in the States on the NES. Play it. It's a really awesome game, big. Like, you know, the music is pretty awesome. So now fast forward a few years later, the same kid who played the game and loved the music on that discovers on the internet that what we got was not the full thing. So, you know, you go find, you go do your search, you find it and you're like blown away because there's just so much more sound like it's so much fuller so much like grittier because of that sawtooth and it's like why what how why were we deprived of this awesomeness you know whereas the Castlevania 3 was pretty rocking the music in Akuma Joe Den sets is like more so because of the extra like pulse width that the uh, extra square channels could reach giving it much more of kind of like that guitar twangy sound and then that sawtooth, which is usually being used to overlay on top of the triangle base to make it that much more grittier, grungier sound. But the reason why I didn't use uh, you know, the Castlevania 3 and Kuma Joe Densets uh, as an example here is because, you know, it's probably been done so many times. I just wanted to get a little something different in here, and I really like Esper Dream 2's soundtrack. It's really good. And so I thought I'd share another one with you. And, you know, I've already shared uh, the shop theme with you on that on my second episode, and we already talked about Kunuyo Yamashita, but, you know, to give you just a really quick rundown, you know, he's done Castlevania, Snatcher, uh, contributed some things to Mega Man The Wily Wars, and that's all you get. But, um, so a little bit more on this chip, you know, it's, uh, probably the most used chip on the, uh, in Famitracker. It's the module or is now, as I think, now it's used, uh, 0cc Tracker because the original Tracker is no longer being, de like, you know, developed. But, yeah, VRC6 is probably what you hear the most, and probably the best example to give you is Jake Kaufman, Vert. Um, if you ever played uh, Shovel Knight, all the music was made in Tracker using the VRC6 sound chip, and, you know, he can work some magic with that and really get, like, some really shred tones out of that. The squares just make him sing. It's that ex just that extra fine detail you get with those at the duty cycle and all and yeah you know you could do some crazy stuff with it if you really really dig in and aside from the audio this is also another mapper chip so you know increase the memory uh you know sprite capabilities colors all that fun stuff all that weird 
registers jargon stuff that, again, I, I'm just ignorant on. But you would have to be really, really ignorant to not be able to tell that uh, Konami really liked their audio. Uh, for the next chip I'm going to be sharing with you is the uh, VRC7, which was actually only used in two games. And uh, one of them only used the audio. So I'm going to share with you Satellite Base from LaGrange Point, composed by Akihata, Akio Dobashi, and Kenji Nakamura. Satellite Base from Lagrange Point, composed by Akihata, Akio Debashi, and Kenji Nakamura. And what? Nintendo doesn't do FM. When I hear this kind of music, I think Sega. I think arcade games, but not Nintendo. Where's all my cheery bleep and bloops? Sorry to tell you, son, but they've been replaced by the smooth preset tones of the VRC7. And what it is, is a, another mapper chip created by Konami with the sound expansion uh, which is six channels of two op FM, 15 preset instruments, along with the uh, ability to, for a uh, one custom patch. So now, this is a derivative of the YM2413 uh, sound chip, which is um, used in both the uh, MSX and the Sega Master System, as well as a few arcade boards. And, you know, the patches in this are just slightly different from the patches in the YM2413. You know, they're a little more softer, a little more rounder. And and it's been recently found out that the VRC7 actually has the capability of the nine channel, like the actual nine channels that the YM2413 has, as well as the rhythm section. So three, making it five channels and three channels of the rhythm. But, you know, that was not used in this game. That is Le Grange Point. Le Grange Point. Le Grange Point. Now the interesting thing here is that all the melodic bits are provided by the FM of the VRC7, but all the percussion is provided by the, you know, the pulse, the noise, and the sample channel of the 2A03. So it's a pretty cool thing. I'm gonna kind of solo out each part so you can hear that. So check it out.
Pretty interesting stuff, huh? So yeah, the, the uh, snare sound is being provided by a combination of one square channel and the noise channel from the 2A03. Um, very similar to how the, a lot of the Konami composers did with the MSX and the AY chip. And then the kick is being provided by the DPCM sample channel. And then of course all the music bits being done provided by the FM. Very nice. You know, I have this odd fascination with um, the combination of PSG drum, like percussion being done with FM music, because like a lot of times, like say for example the Sega Genesis or the NECPC, you know, they got some pretty powerful FM chips there that can create some mighty beefy percussion sounds, or even just like the sample channels being used for percussion. But no, some composers use the PSG, so using a combination of the square and the noise channel to create, you know, percussion sounds, and that's kind of a cool combo. I like. So now about the composers, so the first one up is uh, Dobashi Akio, and um, he was brought on by Konami to compose majority of the music in this game, I believe, um, and he was at the time more well known for the uh, J-pop band Rebecca, and uh, most recent credits I could find were for the three initial D Legends movies back in like 2014, 2015, 2016, and that was about it, and you know, probably big exa biz biggest example would be the uh, opening music for LaGrange Point, I think, you know, as far as, like, music, I think he composed this track as well. And now Akihata, um, she went uncredited in this, but, um, there are a few tracks in here that, you know, upon listening I could tell are hers, and if I really wanted to break it down, I'd probably have to go listen to it pretty in-depth, track by track, figure it out. But instead, I'm going to tell you what other games she has composed for. This game being her first game composition credit, and she would continue to work in uh, Konami doing, uh, what is this, Contra 3 Alien Wars on the SNES, Rocket Knight Adventures, and then she would, she would, along with other composers and programmers from Konami, move into becoming Treasure, and did, uh, helped with uh, McDonald's Treasure Land, uh, Basoja Sensei, Senshi, Sailor Moon, Dynamite Hetty, um, Light Crusader, and then jumping ahead, we're going to Bangayo Oh, Bangai O oh on, uh, on the Dreamcast. Um, and then the latest credit I could find is uh, Stella Glow on the 3DS, but she has also um, written music for multiple animes, uh, has been a lyricist and songwriter for many musicians, and has also done her own um, like music, like her own pop singles and everything. And now Kenji Nakamura, who is also uncredited, um, really the only thing I could find for as far as game credits was this, and then it seems I could find a couple things was... Um, Looked like Idol Masters, he was like a keyboardist for multiple bands and everything. Possibly he was brought in with um, Dobashi to work on this game, maybe. I don't know, but I could also find another credit for, a, uh, maybe it might be another Kenji Nakamura for an uh, anime director and producer. But it's probably not the same guy. So now a bit about this game. It is a sci-fi RPG set in the far-off future of the 22nd century. And, set, and it takes place on, on a cluster of colonies in space. And um, as far as how it looks, it looks really nice. It looks really cool. Um, it kind of looks like a step down from early Super Famicom RPGs, so like like Dragon Quest IV, actually, I want to say. And um, you know that's thanks to that VRC7 mapper chip. Not only audio, but also helping the visuals out. And kind of skimming it over, the uh, the story itself is pretty pretty jam packed. Some like you know sci-fi conspiracy plots and cool little twists and turns going on, so a lot more from your standard uh, fantasy fare that you were getting on the NES or the Famicom at the time. And a fun little factoid, Konami did, much like how Capcom did with the Robot Masters and some later Mega Man games on the NES, had um, put out polls and magazines for like actual people to like you know submit things for monster designs and NPC dialogue and some plot elements and all, so like some of the things that happened in the game are from you know the fan community cool thing. So now we're getting out of the land of Konami and moving on into Namco with the Namco 163. So the next track I'm going to play for you is Strategy Phase from King of Kings composed by Hirohiko Takeyama.
have a strategy phase from King of Kings, composed by Hirohiko Takeyama. And you may have noticed that this sounds more like something that would be on the PC Engine or TurboGrafx-16, and that is due to the Namco 163's 8-channel wavetable. Though uh, actually this game, and one other game, with Erika to Saturno Yume Bolken, which just so happens to also be composed by Hirohiko Takeyama, are the only two games to have used all eight channels. All the other games that were made using this chip only used four, so that would be, let me run you down the quick list here. We got, you know, Final Lap, Mappy, Rolling Thunder, Hide Light 3, Digital Devil Story, Goddess Reincarnation 2. And a quick fun factoid is that Arc System Works was the first company to use this chip in, I believe, in the game Final Lap. And like I said, it was only the four channels. And in case of the song, all the sounds are produced by that Namco 163 chip. Uh, the only sound that's produced by the 2A03 is the noise used for some percussion. And that's it, so everything else, so I'm not gonna be soloing anything out because all I'd be losing is the noise. And now here's a weird little factoid, and that is even though Namco developed the chip, they never actually developed any games that use the chip, they only published games that use the chip. So let me tell you about Hirohiko Takeyama. He got his start at Atlas, doing uh, Digital Devil Monogatari uh, Megami Tensai, and then would go on to do Karate Kid, uh, Zexis, that Erika game and this game, uh, Friday the 13th, and then let's jump ahead here, he also did, um, what is this, Bonk's Revenge, Time Zone, uh, Adventure Island 3 on the NES, Lemmings on the Genesis Mega Drive, and then his last credit is Uchu Saibutsu Flopunkun. And then he also made music for quite a few unreleased titles, so we got uh, Adventure Romance, Battle Ball, uh, Gaia, Happily Ever After, Sunman, just to name a few of those. And uh, during his time at Atlas, he composed all his music with a driver by uh, Tsukasa Masuko in Hexadecimal on MS-DOS, and then later would be using a, a driver by Michia Hirosawa. Man, coming at you with the deep dives. So since 1998, he uh, founded Aeon Do, where people can purchase the music that he's just producing himself for nothing else other than, you know, just to make it. And um, he's also teaches at a college, and he's currently writing books on music composing, software, and, you know, other things. And so now about this game, King of Kings, pub uh, developed by Atlas. It is a another strategy game, um, but more of kind of like a resource management one, I think. So kind of looking at it, you're, how the system works is that you have a king, you keep him in the castle, and then as long as he's in the castle, they, you can produce stuff, you know, produce foods, goods, weapons, more funds for your troops to go out and do battles. And uh, their movement is limited by how much food they have in stock. So if they run out of food, they're stuck until a monk or like somehow they're able to get back to the castle to heal. I don't know, some, some wacky stuff. You got 22 different types of playable units. So that's gonna be a lot of mouths to feed. So you gotta keep that supply line going. And where we're going is the uh, last track of the episode. So what I'm gonna kind of send you off here with is um, from Gimmick. It's gonna be a Good Night Take Two by Masashi Kageyama.
That was Good Night, Take Two, from Gimmick, or Mr. Gimmick as it is known in Scandinavia, composed by Masashi Kageyama. And boy, howdy, did he take that sunsoft sound, you know, those really powerful triangle kicks and snares, that sunsoft bass, and just kicked it up a notch. And that isn't thanks to the Sunsoft 5B, which itself is a uh, variation on a previous mapper chip, the FME70 by Sunsoft, except this one contains an extra sound unit, which is the YM2149F, which is a variation on the AY38910, which was used in the MSX systems. And what this adds is three channels of PSG, so just three extra pulse channels, which are slightly different in tone from the 2A03 square channels. And like the AY chip, it had the possibility of uh, producing noise in any one of the three channels as well as like an extra envelope, but it wasn't used, didn't really need to. But the biggest part of course is that, you know, just Kageyama's compositions themselves, I mean like ranging anywhere from jazz fusion to pop to rock to just whatever new sound he could create. I think I saw somewhere that Kageyama kind of describes this as a compilation of game music, so just like taking all these different genres that, you know, game music can be and just mashing it all into this one soundtrack. So now to get to the back to the 5B, um, I'm gonna bring the track back up, but then also gonna fade it back down, but keeping the 5B up, but keeping the main track kind of there so you can kind of hear what's going on. All right, here we go. So as you could probably tell, he uh, used the 5B mostly for backing melodies, some lower end stuff. And uh, yeah, it's just amazing just how much something as simple as those three extra channels can add. Taking what would have been another su like stellar Sunsoft soundtrack and again, just get taking it to that next level. You take that and combine it with Kageyama's love and knowledge of just these different musical genres and you just get Amazing good sounds and another big help would also be that Tomomi Sakai the director of this game and Kageyama shared very similar musical tastes So, you know, uh, Tomomi would suggest this to Kageyama say like hey, could you fit this in there make music sound like this? And you know he would do it and then also other staff that were working on the game would you know Just come at him with suggestions say hey put this in here put that in there So that's kind of also another reason why the soundtrack is just so varied is because you know, taking in his own musical taste, taking in like the taste of the other staff, and kind of just making it work as one cohesive piece. It's, it's amazing. All right, so now what ha what other games has Masashi Kageyama composed for? Well, the list isn't big, so we're gonna go down it real quick here. So started out with Outlive on PC Engine, then Benkai Gaiden on the PC Engine, Mr. Gimmick, this game, um, Robot Construction on the X68000, Benkai Gaiden Suna no Sho on the Super Famicom. Daisa Tonosama Apare Ichiban on the Super Famicom, Iwatoba Penguin Rocky X Hopper on the PS1, The Solitaire on PS1, and then his last actual o video game OST, which is Purumui Purumui on the PS1. And then he most recently contributed uh, a few songs to a game series called Opidius. If you know what the word Opai is, uh, you can imagine what this game probably is. Now, one last little note is that. Um, there's this mini documentary six-parter called Diggin' in the Carts, 
which covers like the you know VGM history from like the early bleeps and bloops of the arcade all the way up to like when games started using CD audio in like PS1 era and stuff. And uh, in one of the episodes, they talk about like kind of the expansion chips of the Famicoms. And one of the parts, I think the last bit is talking about this game gimmick and its soundtrack. And they have some interviews with Kageyama and. Oh man, he's just he's just a sweet little man, you know, just with saxophone, riding his bike around rice fields, like like they actually start like play some of the music while showing him riding around on his bike, and it's just so like I don't know, it's kind of just endearing, really really nice to see. And like I said, he has a saxophone, he's just making faces at you. He's like you know, it's what my wife would call a, a nice baby. And uh, actually, this documentary is kind of one of the things that inspired me to you know do my one month trip in Japan. I'll probably do a whole episode on that at some point. And so there you have it. A quick rundown of all the different expansion chips that for audio on the Famicom. You know, not super detailed, but, you know, enough to kind of give you, like, you know, wet your whistle and intrigue you if you haven't heard of these or, like, you haven't really explored them. I knew this was all blowing my mind when I was first discovering it getting close to, like, 15 years ago. But, ah, I can't forget that there is a lot of original chiptune being made, you know, now and, like, throughout these past years, like, just using all these chips. And, uh, maybe I might actually do an episode focusing on those as well, kind of doing the same thing, choosing one original track for each expansion chip. It'll be a fun thing to do. And now it's time for the shameless shilling of social... sites. Yeah? Okay, so... You can find me, Rage Cage, R A Y J K A Y J, your host, at you know on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, I have a YouTube that I'm now starting to actually upload my original chiptune stuff to, as well as covers, and then you know of course a SoundCloud, and then where you can find VG Emporium is also on Twitter and Instagram, um, on all the podcasters that you may listen to. And then eventually, eventually, I keep saying this, but we'll create a YouTube channel for it as well to post it on there if that's your preferred way of listening to podcasts. Kind of silly that I'm 15 episodes in and I still haven't done it. Now as for next week's episode, well, it's going to be a focus on a uh, particular blue individual with a very brief appearance, guest appearance from a special guest person that happens to be obsessed with this blue fellow. So yeah, look forward to that. So once again, thank you for coming in to VG Emporium, and have yourself a good rest of your day.